Washington University in St. Louis's Danforth campus was conceived in the early 1900s in the collegiate Gothic architectural style by Cope and Stewardson. Seen from the original buildings on campus to the newest buildings, collegiate Gothic permeates with a twist compared to other campuses as the buildings primarily feature Missouri red granite. Even when the university decided to experiment with other architectural styles, such as with the Mallinckrodt Center, where slabs of the granite can still be seen on the exterior of the building, deviation from the general aesthetic was rare. Thus, the legacy of the twin buildings, Mud Hall and Elliott Hall, which completely diverge from collegiate Gothic, remains a standout in WashU's history. Before Mud and Elliott, in particular on Elliott's plot of land, was the Student Activity Center, or the SAC, which was around from 1948 to 1968 and was replaced by the Mallinckrodt Center across the quad in 1972. In the mid-1960s, Hiram Lessar, the Dean of the School of Law, submitted a proposal for a new law building to replace January Hall, which the school had far outgrown. The project was approved by Carl Doughton, the Vice Chancellor for Administration in January 1966. Meanwhile, under the Graduate Academic Facilities Program, a new building for social sciences was approved. Through 1966, the university held an architectural competition for the new buildings, combined as one complex. The university wanted a design that would stand out, and many unique design proposals were submitted. On January 5, 1967, the proposal submitted by Shendley and Silovicius, Montgomery Architects, was chosen. What's important to know is that Anselavicius was the Dean of the School of Architecture, so as WashU historian Jim Burmeister notes, that may have had something to do with the final decision. Construction commenced with a groundbreaking ceremony in the late 1960s and continued through 1971 when both buildings opened. Mudd housed the law school while Elliott housed social and political sciences, including the economics department. When this building was designed, it was designed as a single building. Very late in the process, the, the law school realized that to be an accredited law school, you had to have a freestanding building. And so they were very quickly changed the architecture. So Mudd and Elliott were, two, were actually two buildings with about a one inch gap in between them. And in Elliott Hall and in Mudd Hall, you had hallways that would have connected had the buildings been, so you just had hallways that went to nothing. We used to say it was the widest foot on campus because we didn't interact much with the law faculty. In spring 1972, Mud Hall officially held its dedication ceremony, attended by many luminous figures of the university, including former Chancellor Ethan Shepley, current Chancellor at the time, Bill Danforth, Dean Lessar, and Michael Newmark, former chair of the Alumni Board of Governors. Elliott was not dedicated until 1974, featuring another ceremony attended by Chancellor Danforth and the former Chancellor for whom the building was named, Thomas Elliott. The two buildings, unlike most of the rest of WashU, featured brutalist architecture and were clad in concrete. The roofs of the buildings were painted green, though they appear blue in color photographs. The green roof, it really stuck out. They were hideous, ugly, terrible green. The walls are bare concrete. They're marked, they're like streaks going down from the roof to the floor. The floor is like a gray-white linoleum. There's nothing on the walls. It, it was just an ugly, ugly building. I don't know, it, there's no other word for it. It's just this concrete bunker is what it looked like. And then you get inside, you realize, oh, this is a concrete bunker. It was basically the same in and out. The centerpiece of the two buildings and the main access point off of Mud Field was a large concrete courtyard with steps for gatherings. Because the doors were on the sides of the two buildings, the courtyard was meant to foster social activity between classes as students shuffled through. In the courtyard stood a sculpture by the famed Alexander Calder. The courtyard at the top had a, a, a square hole that went out to a faux balcony that looked straight over U City. Oh look, we can look over the city here. Like, and you could sit out there, you could have a cigarette and look out over the city. It was nice. Once inside, you would be greeted with a maze of concrete halls each door distinguished by a primary color, making you think that the designers made it for a preschool. It was sort of a, it was somewhat of a maze as a building. It took me a while to find the stairs to go to my classroom. 
So it wasn't the most hospitable environment to learn in. The interiors, these are very nondescript places. And the thing is, you wouldn't have huge populations of students roaming. You would have students studying. You wouldn't have people hanging out in large numbers. An exception to the lack of people were the large foyers at the entrance of each building. MUDS was affectionately known as the Pit, which hosted many events such as auctions. When you walked into the Pit, there was an immediate sort of hive of activity. There were people around, people talking. It was unstructured and, and you'd find some people arguing about a case or a class or something, but mostly it was, you know, arguments about baseball or, or something. We brought kegs in occasionally on a Friday night with people at barbecue outside. In the basement of mud was the Eugene A. and Adeline Freund Law Library. Undergraduates were not encouraged when I was a student to be using the law school's library, and that was for the law school students. During the regular part of the school year, any WashU student was allowed to come in. That was fine. During the reading period before finals, it was limited just to law students. And Macmillan and Elliot were connected to each other, so you didn't have to go outside and get rained on or snowed on. The loading docks and the understories of mud is this large colonnaded area, and riding a bike at top speed around that was tremendously fun. There was an elevator on the Elliott side that we would get into and ride the elevator up and down for no reason at all. In 1974, issues with mud began to show and it was decided that an addition would be built, adding over 12,000 square feet. Specifically, it was the George F. McMillan Wing, which opened in fall 1976 and was described in a 1976 edition of Washington Magazine as having, quote, spanned the North Roadway, end quote. In 1981, Trading Post 8 from the New York Stock Exchange was relocated to Elliott Hall. Time went on for the two buildings, and by 1982, more issues arose, especially regarding the aesthetics of both the interior and exterior of the buildings, and issues with classrooms, such as acoustic problems, as well as space issues that the law school was facing. Through 1984, proposals were submitted as to how the buildings would be fixed, but nothing ever seemed to come of them. Mud Hall was not working, and people were unhappy from basically the outset because of the lack of functionality for what the law school was aspiring to do in their educational programs. It could not be easily changed, being concrete. After about another decade of issues, it was decided that any renovations or additions to MUD would be too costly, as well as issues with the building complying with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So in 1995, the construction of Anheuser-Busch Hall began for the law school. The new building corrected most of the issues of MUD. It returned to the collegiate Gothic architectural style and is twice the size of and easier to get around than MUD was. The law school moved into the building in January 1997. That led to a tremendous lift in morale among faculty. I believe it propelled the school uh, to great heights. In the interim, it was first suggested for MUD to be renovated. Instead, it was, quote, used to temporarily house people while other university buildings are renovated, end quote. June and July 1998 saw the demolition of MUD. I missed the demolition of MUD. And talking to my colleagues, it's a good thing that I missed it. When they built this building, they put extra rebar in the concrete. And so they needed jackhammers to take this building down. And so you imagine sitting in an office and right outside on a common foundation, all you hear is <coughs> for days and days and days. I talked to my colleagues at the time. So first they bought everybody headphones. That might fix things and that didn't really help. Then, and this was at a time where laptops weren't as commonly used as they were today, everybody got a laptop and everybody basically went home. The demolition of MUD was captured in the student films, Mudzilla and Son of Mudzilla. And we actually studied the redevelopment of Mud Hall and determined that we could create a new executive education center. That uh, led us to have a building site, which is now the site upon which the Charles F. Knight 
Executive Education Center is located. Knight Center was announced in September 1998 to replace MUD, and it opened in 2001. Elliot was not touched at this time, though. While some felt that Elliot was still serviceable. I taught, I had a classroom there once, and it was fine. It was innocuous as a building for me. It wasn't any more remarkable than Simon Hall in terms of the interior space. It was a similar effect. A little bit more drafty, and I gathered it had more problems technically for the offices there. It had trouble adapting to 21st century uses, such as lacking Wi-Fi. Additionally, people's frustration with the building continued to grow, with common complaints about its awkward layout, starkly contrasting architecture, and hard-to-find entrances. One of the thrills I had early on was to meet with Professor Douglas North, who earned a Nobel Prize in economics. And I went to visit with him at his office in Elliott Hall. I was surprised that he immediately brought up the issues around Elliott. Elliott Hall was leaking, leaking onto his desk. Every day when Doug left the office, he had this big piece of plastic and he would pull this over his computer, his desk, and all of his papers uh, so his office wouldn't flood. He underscored the unworkability of Elliot Hall and how difficult it was to be housed there. We used to tell people, when we had people come to visit, we would say, look, you can find Elliot easily. Just find the ugliest building on campus. That's us. I remember going to visit Professor Lowry. He was my advisor. I remember having a lot of meetings with him. I just thought, oh man, what did you deserve to end up in this building? <laughs> But, um, but then later, yeah, feeling like, okay, this is a department that is here because, you know, they really care about the work. It's not so much about the frills of the, the buildings. What I thought about it when I was an adult is, why don't they paint this? I don't understand why the students didn't start running around doing murals on those giant concrete walls, that it might have actually made the place stick around longer. So I have such wonderful memories in that building of working closely with my fellow graduate students, with my undergraduate students involved in research. It was a department at the time and still today, had a wonderful esprit de corps. And so we could be in a really ugly space that wasn't conducive, uh, but we made it work. Some of my most joyful times as a scholar uh, were in that awful gray concrete bunker. In 2008, many of Elliot's old departments, including economics and political science, moved to the newly opened Siegel Hall. It took a while to garner the resources that made it possible to expand facilities for social sciences. It, it is Siegel Hall, which is a very impressive building. Siegel, it's a nice building, but it's also kind of sterile. You know, it feels a little bit more corporate. Elliot felt very familiar and comfortable. Elliot hung around for a few years after that, playing host to the Center for the Humanities and Film and Media Studies, but was finally demolished in May and June 2012. Part of you was like, they need to just finish this and get rid of the rest of it. And the other part of you was like, kind of cheering for it, you know, that it would just outlast everything else, maybe. I remember like hearing they're going to get rid of Elliot, and I'm like, okay. You know, I don't know what Elliot himself would have thought about it. Like, you know, it's... My associations with English literature, I, I ridiculously associate it with the wrong Eliot. So whenever I heard Eliot, I thought of T.S. And it probably wasn't, but it didn't matter to me. Its replacement, Bower and Knight Halls, opened in 2014 and connected to the Knight Center, further expanding the Olin Business School. I do remember coming back when I was appointed chancellor in the summer of 2018 and seeing Knight Bower. I was like, wow. Remember what used to be here. Both the Mudd and Elliot names live on in residence halls on the South 40. Though Mudd and Elliot halls may have been controversial, the legacy of their uniqueness is important to commemorate. Stay tuned for more episodes of The Secret History of Wash U.